This podcast is supported by Siemens, your partner for industrial grade AI. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of our industrial AI podcast. My name is Robert Beber. Before we talk about industrial AI, one important note. In October, we will meet with Professor Dr. Frank Hutter and his team at Arbwork to discuss AutoML and TAP PFN for industrial applications. As you know, we have a fixed industrial AI group, but we keep adding five listeners to the group. So if you want to join us, drop us a message at robert at AIPod.de or via LinkedIn. Like last time with AI in the Alps, we will collect the applications and then inform you. And now let's go to the interview with Rebecca Acesati from Merix, which we recorded at the AI with Purpose Summit by Siemens. The interview comes at the right time because since Monday, there's the first LLM from China. Enjoy listening. So my guest today is Rebecca Ashizati. Hello, Rebecca. Welcome. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. We want to talk about China and AI. But before we start, can you please introduce yourself briefly to the listeners? Sure. My name is Rebecca Ashizati. I'm a lead analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies. We are uh, Europe's largest independent think tank focused entirely on the study and research of contemporary China. Uh, we mostly like doing policy or oriented research and analysis of China, and I work in the science, tech, and innovation policy team. So what I research is basically China's technology, innovation, and digital policy. There's this rumor that the Chinese government is trying to, with generative AI, may only emerge socialist content. Is this serious? It's for real. It's for real. I can confirm that. It's in the policy documents, including the regulations that came out last year to govern recommendation systems. So algorithms that basically recommend and push content to users online. But how realistic is that? It's realistic in the sense that if you look at China's strategy for AI, the Chinese government strategy, they really recognize the potential of AI, the transformative potential in terms of improving public services, increasing productivity, improving also China's governance capabilities. But they also see that certain algorithms have what they call a capability to mobilize public opinion. That's especially the case for algorithms that tech firms deploy online to, to push content or, or ads to users. And Because China's internet, unlike the internet that we're used to uh, here in Europe, is, is tightly censored and controlled, the idea that tech firms can just deploy algorithms in ways that maybe lead to the spread of politically sensitive information that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like it is something that they're really careful about. And so the idea is that the party state wants to have a say in how large internet platforms deploy also designed, to be fair, uh, and deploy algorithms um, that can be used to shape public opinion and discourse online. I think every big region has his own strategy. Huh? But I think in China, there's a formula strategy, or I'm wrong, because in Germany, we do not have a strategy on AI, really, but they have a very close strategy on AI. Well, other countries, too, have come up with their own uh, national strategies for AI, including some European countries. Uh, China is definitely remarkable in the way in which the government really prioritized AI at the central level. Uh, if you look at 2017, they released uh, what is, uh, to this day, China's major master plan for AI development, uh, the new generation AI development plan. And that really sent a powerful signal to the innovation ecosystem in China that AI was a priority. And that meant that a lot of, for instance, public funding started going into into the ecosystem, both central government and local government funding, that companies were incentivized through different measures and incentives to work on AI, to develop new products, to integrate AI with real use cases. So that really led to a boom of the industry in China. A lot of new companies' registrations. China publishes the most AI papers. 
And a lot of patents. A lot of patents as well. So this wave of AI research outputs and also company registrations, uh, the value of the industry uh, reached 68 billion euros in, in 2020. And in 2022, AI firms in China received more private investment than you know, their counterparts in Europe, but also in the UK. China is also second to the US in terms of newly funded AI companies and private sector. AI investments. So that's also really dynamic. The US is still in the lead, but there's a lot of funding that goes into the ecosystem in China. But what is so difficult there? Because there's a political influence on this strategy, right? It's very political, for sure. Um, I think the Chinese government has recognized that AI is a strategic set of technologies. AI can be greatly beneficial for things like upgrading China's manufacturing industry, which is something that the government is really focused focus on because they have an issue with productivity. They know that China wants to escape the middle income trap and they see AI as a, really a tool that can help China achieve that. AI is also very useful for uh, military applications. And as uh, the Chinese government has embarked upon a really ambitious campaign to modernize its military forces, uh, they view AI as a very important tool for achieving that. And so AI is important for civilian innovation, for economic growth, but also for China's geopolitical ambitions. Let's talk a little bit about the relations and these decoupling initiatives in Europe. Decoupling from AI, are there relations between European research universities, Chinese companies, universities? And how to decouple these relations or how to transform these relations maybe? Stay tuned because we are actually going to publish at Merrick's a report that looks into European-Chinese AI collaborations. It's coming out in September. Uh, so I'm spoiling a little bit, also thanking uh, the Federal Foreign Office for their generous uh, support for this project. So we will look at basically co-publications uh, in AI as well as investment flows. When you look at the investment picture, I think it pales in comparison to ties between the US and China. That's quite clear. At the same time, we're seeing European companies starting to look at China's uh, startup ecosystem, finding opportunities and stepping up VC activities in the market. But where I think there are the most interesting linkages is really at the level of basic research, basic AI research. You know, uh, European and Chinese scientists working together within hundreds of labs in Europe and China. Some focus on more applied AI, like industrial AI. Others really focus on fundamental stuff like um, uh, AI theory, natural language processing, AI brain research. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, interesting work that's being done by Uh, European and Chinese scientists together. Uh, if you look at co-publications, of course, again, the numbers don't really compare to uh, US-China collaborations. But at the same time, you know, the UK is the second largest partner for China in terms of international co-publications, so co-authored papers in AI. And Germany is also a, quite a significant partner. And what about this decoupling now? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's that's <laughs> the, the difficult, difficult question. Yeah. And it is a difficult question because I think it's clear that geopolitical tensions are coming in the way of what used to be a fairly open industry, unrestrained openness, open source as a value that was uh, the norm before. But now that uh, both the US and China are really competing to uh, dominate the field, and because of some linkages that even some civilian actors like universities in China have with the Chinese military or with the Chinese uh, public security apparatus, a lot of people are starting to wonder, okay, are my collaborations with those partners posing any risks, for instance, from a human rights perspective or, or from a national security perspective? And I think in Europe too, not just in the US, we're, we're starting to see a rethink where not just policymakers, but also some universities, some labs, companies I talk to are really starting to think through those questions quite, quite seriously, wondering, okay, is computer science really politics free or should we maybe think that some collaborations should be maybe stopped? Because we're not sure how the end uses of those research outputs are going to work in China. If, if someone is going to maybe redirect what we produce here through our collaboration towards 
towards, you know, maybe military applications or biometric surveillance. So these are really difficult questions because at the same time, there's also a great deal of collaboration that's beneficial. And so you can't easily draw lines and say, okay, this is a black or white framework that universities should work with. So I think policymakers are having a bit of a hard time finding nuanced policy solutions to this challenge. You mentioned these US-Chinese collaboration in, in basic research on research, but this is shifting, right? What is your data on this? I think it's a bit soon to tell whether geopolitical tensions were behind the decline we're seeing in terms of uh, co-publications in some STEM fields between the US and China. Why? Because COVID also came in the way. And so that makes it hard, I think, for us to um, interpret the data. At the same time, I think we, we did see that geopolitical tensions started having a chilling effect on some collaborations. In the US, unfortunately, because of these uh, tensions with China, there have been policies that I think have targeted um, Chinese scientists, and that has led to a lot of scientists maybe not feeling very very safe or very comfortable working with, in the US anymore and deciding to leave, to go back to China, which is something that the Chinese government very much wants. They want to not just nurture talent domestically, but also attract returnees Uh, to go back to China. And if those scientists don't feel welcome in, in other countries, it is only more likely that Beijing will try to exploit that. Uh, so we're seeing some of that having an impact on on people-to-people -people exchanges and scientific collaboration. You mentioned this open source topic. China has its own so open source foundation and also in response to this Android export ban and the USA bans on GPUs, ASML machines are in the port still. China has an export ban on algorithms. How will this de develop in the next two to five years? I think it's quite clear that we're looking at AI ecosystems that are increasingly bifurcated or fragmented, at least. But for the IT technology, it's totally new. That's totally new. It is new, although it's something that I think the Chinese government has been thinking about for a long time. You know, they started already in the 2000s really thinking about, okay, what are the risks associated with having uh, U.S. software and hardware and relying too much on that? Shouldn't we instead develop indigenous technologies that are, as the Chinese Communist Party calls them, secure and controllable? So basically indigenous. So they've managed to indigenize in a lot of fields, but you mentioned chips. That's a major weakness for China's AI industry because indeed they rely on foreign produced hardware. Um, the uh, Biden administration introduced these uh, major export controls last October to restrict advanced semiconductor exports to China. That includes, for instance, GPUs, meaning that essentially no GPU on the planet that meets certain performance thresholds can be shipped to China anymore. Now, as a response to that, China is trying to develop alternatives. They're trying to uh, develop their own AI chips. They're also trying to do something like combining different chips to train their models so that they don't rely too much on, on, on hardware from any company. They're trying to go for AI solutions that require less computing power. Uh, so they're experimenting with a lot of things to try to bypass the, the US controls or at least be able to withstand the impact of, of these technology trade uh, restrictions. And I think that as a result, we're going to see an ecosystem, and to some degree, we're already seeing an ecosystem that's more self-contained compared to the past. And I think it's interesting to look at its large language models. China is developing a wide range of large language models. ChatGPT isn't available in China, sure, Uh, but a lot of labs, a lot of companies in China are really experimenting big with uh, their own LLMs. This is something that's being prioritized. Maybe they won't be as... But with socialist content. With socialist content, for sure. That's a technical challenge, because how do you make sure that you know a chatbot doesn't return 
content that, let's say, politically acceptable, that's very difficult from a technical perspective, because yes, you can train it on censored data, but it's still very difficult, as you know, to uh, still make sure that the content is fully in line with what the Chinese Communist Party wants to see. And that's why a lot of Chinese companies are struggling to release these models, because they are afraid that if they don't comply with what will soon be finalized regulations on LLMs in China, they will face repercussions. Is this a back step for technology in, in China? This political influence? Because you mentioned they're struggling and it's difficult. That's a good question. That's in a way, you know, a question a lot of people started posing already with the internet itself, if you think about it. I think there was that now very infamous quote by uh, Bill Clinton in the 90s. He said that if China wanted to develop a, a thriving digital economy while having censorship, it would be like hitting the, the wall, trying to nail jello on the wall, mm -hmm. that it couldn't work. Well, it did. Right. And so the question now is, will China be able to uh, still uh, build a thriving AI industry while at the same time keeping uh, such, you know, tight uh, political restrictions on the sector? I think it's still an open question. I don't feel comfortable saying that because of the political limitations, Chinese companies won't be able to, for instance, develop their own large language models. I think we were mistaken, a lot of people in the West, when we assumed that the digital economy in China wouldn't grow because of that. What does it all mean for European companies? How should German or European companies react on this now? I think it's important for companies to, first of all, understand the ecosystem in China, invest, you know, studying not just the ecosystem itself, but also corporate state relations in China. I think it's very important to realize that they work very differently compared to the European context. So know your partners, also because from a compliance and from a reputational perspective, frankly, it's really important to make sure that when embarking upon any research or commercial collaborations with Chinese partners, a company really knows well what it's doing. And if there are any, for instance, risks associated with undesirable data or knowledge or technology transfers, that the company has the processes and the structures in place to, to manage those risks. There are a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, because of the nature of China's political system and corporate state relations there, a company can't be naive and just go to China's market without really thinking seriously about some of the potential risks and negative effects. Let's switch to a different point about uh, the policy makers in Europe. Do we need a China strategy for the European Union or for, the, for Germany or for France? And what should be in this China strategy? What should be the, the main topics in this China strategy? Ha, that's a big question. I think, and, and Marix has spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, European China policy and how that should look like. Maybe uh, taking it from the perspective of technology policy, I do believe that policymakers in Europe still haven't invested enough into understanding China's innovation system. I do think China understands us much more what than so we understand. What's so different? Can you can you give us two examples of what is so different in this innovation System. Well, for example, uh, you know, the nexus between different actors in the system, how a civilian lab in China affiliated with universities like Tsinghua University or the Chinese Academy of Sciences is also on the side maybe developing prototypes for the Chinese military. So those lines that we have in Europe between civilian and military and also state security, so the policing apparatus, are in quite there in the Chinese context. And understanding those connections and how they work requires a lot of work. I can tell you because I do that on a daily <laughs> yeah. basis in terms of due diligence, for example. And that's where policymakers, I think, should come in. Because frankly, I don't think we can expect, you know, computer scientists at a maybe small university in Germany to have the information to do that kind of verification work, to really understand how China's ecosystem works and then make informed decisions about engagement. I think policymakers really have a role to play in, first of all, investing in collecting information about China's innovation system and also making that information available to the stakeholders that need it. That's your job. That is basically my job. Thank you, Rebecca. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>